Welcome to episode 278 of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger, and as always, it's brought to you by Batano.ca. The game starts now at Batano.ca. A full slate of games in the National Hockey League. How about tonight, five Stanley Cup final rematches? Now, it's been a few years for the uh, the Rangers in the uh, the Cup final rematch, but uh, you have uh, Tampa Bay and Colorado. You have the Ducks and Ottawa and many others. So if you want to go a five-game parlay, Frank, on uh, former uh, Stanley Cup final matchups. You could do it tonight at Botano.ca. Frank, that is the you? most Jason Greger stat I've ever heard. <laughs> Kings, Devils. Oh, yeah. Do- I mean, I Ducks, Sens. Like, I was like, Sens? Cup yeah, final? 2007. Yeah, yeah. You got to go yeah. back a little ways. You know, you got to go back. Montreal and the Habs was 1979. So, you know, it's, oh, it's wow. an obscure stat that I got from, uh, from the NHL. So, you know me. I love the... Uh, Love the obscure stats every now and then. So it's good. So I like it. Um, there is, there's lots of stats. I guess, I guess we can start off with, um, I, I'm guessing there's, there's the Penguins and any team who is interested in Jake Gensel is patiently waiting to hear how serious or not serious the upper body injury is. Gensel didn't play the last 12 minutes of the game last night. They lose to the Panthers. We could, I, I don't know if you want to put the, uh, um, you know, the, the line through the Penguins officially yet, Frank, or not. I don't know if you can in the mushy middle of the East and the Western Conference playoff races, but that is a, that's potentially a you know, worst case scenario for all parties involved. Yeah, they didn't just lose to the Panthers. They got worked is the yeah. truth. And yeah. look, I think everyone has been watching this Penguin season this year, waiting for the moment that they just burst through and become a playoff team because of the collection of talent that they have. Yeah. But I also think we've seen no evidence to this point to think that it's coming. No, there's been a couple good five game stretches, but there's been way more bad ones. And they, you know, they really kind of limped into the break at the tail end of it. And since then, that was their third straight loss. They're three, five, and two in their last 10. Just on a pure points basis, the only team worse than them in the Metro is Columbus. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, they've got a lot of ground to cover. And I just, if you're looking for the sign, everyone, you know, all season has been pointing to, hey, goal differential. Look at this team. They're the only one with a plus goal differential. That's outside the playoffs. It that can't be the only indicator to hang your hat on because I'm not seeing it eye test wise. No, they they haven't found any consistency, and and right now they're you know if you look at points percentage, you look at uh, goal differential, they're still below Toronto and Detroit, who are both holding down the the final two spots. You know, I think the thing for the Penguins, the hope is games in hand. That's right now. That's the only thing that makes them look good because they're actually in points. They're closer to 14th than they are to eighth place. And, and that becomes an issue. Like the Montreal Canadiens, for goodness sakes, I know they played three more games, but they're one point back all of a sudden. Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield are rolling. Slavkovsky and Montreal, the young guys are playing well. They're not going to make the playoffs, of course. But um, Pittsburgh is, they're going in the wrong direction for a team that's, you know, supposed to be desperate and in a hunt here, Frank. Uh, it's just not the right time to lose three in a row. And, and it's not just how they're losing. As you mentioned earlier, they're getting worked. Yeah, and and by the way, um, there's a real reason to be excited about the Montreal Canadiens down the stretch. Like, they're going to start picking up some more of their young guys. Lane Hudson, I'm sure after the NCAA season ends, he's going to be turning pro. They're going to be able to get some of their other prospects in. Like, it's you see those guys, the young guys that you mentioned, rolling right now. And Slavkovsky has, you know, really looked a lot better of late. All of a sudden, it starts to get really interesting. Yeah, well, you know, good for them. Um, I, I know their 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 GM talked about, hey, we'd like to rid ourselves of a goalie, but you know, the way Jake Allen's playing, man, I think it's going to be really hard to do. But you know, we'll even if you take him at, at half price now. Hey, maybe I don't it changes. see. I disagree. Yeah, Jake Allen at sub two million bucks. What like Which, he Colorado? Has a three, just some uh, Colorado would make sense to me. Like, think about how they had to rely on Francois a couple years ago in the playoffs like you need your backup sometimes and oh, you yes. hate to be one of those teams that 
you know, misses out or loses because you left your goaltending to chance. And I, I just think we've got a 350 game sample size from Jake Allen at nine 11 to know that uh, just, just look at the standings. I mean, look at what we were just talking about. I said, uh, before the show started that the Canadians have scored more goals than the Penguins. As a whole, the Canadians have given up 51 more goals than the Penguins. They've given up 51 more. I, to me, that's not an indicator of goaltending. That's an indicator of team strength and defense. And, uh, you know, I don't think Jake Allen, these last two seasons, while the team has been bad in front of him, just became no good. Uh, maybe, but we just, I, I mean, think get... about it. They're, they're one of the 20, 25 to 30 teams in the league, 25th to 30th place. Yeah. How are we going to just... blame the goalie? Well, I just look at the difference of the goalies internally when you're playing behind the same system. I, I, I agree. I wouldn't compare him to the rest of the league. I just compare him to the goalies playing with, and you know, Montembeau's got significantly better numbers. Okay. Can I just read you the seven guys in Montreal's defense? Their number no. one defenseman is Mike Matheson. Yeah, yeah. Matheson, Savard, Jordan Harris, Jaden Struble, Caden Gooley, Arbor Jackeye, and Jonathan Kovacevic. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a stellar defense car. I, I don't uh, be a hell not, of a Scrabble lineup though. Yeah, not arguing. Kovacevic, just... Jackeye, Gooley, Struble. Come on, that's yeah. elite. Now, now maybe Jake Allen, I'd have to dig deep and maybe he's playing all the tougher games potentially, but you know, his, his save percentage is worse and his goals against average is significantly higher than Montembeau and Caden Primo. So that'd be my only thing. I'm sure that a team's going to take him here, right? Because they'll look and say, Hey, we've got, you know, seven more years of a mar larger sample size. that says this guy can be good for us. And if you're Colorado, for sure, like Colorado has got to find a backup other, otherwise they're by the time they get to the playoffs, Georgia is going to be all, you know, it's going to be like a coyote, right? All yeah. I mean, the key for Allen is, is next year at sub 2 million bucks. Yeah. Like you've got your guy next year for 1.95 or 1925. That's a pretty, pretty good price for a guy of that career arc and caliber at who will only be 34 next year at for goalies. That's, that's, you know, they're still in the prime at 34. What do you think that, so then if Montreal is retaining half, what are they going to want? It can't, I mean, that's the thing. It can't really be that much. You could probably get a second for him. Oof, geez. I think they do cartwheels if they get a second. But it's it's probably, you know, I'd say in, in the best case scenario, you're getting a second, but it's probably a third. Yeah. But still, they have to clear their log jam. Oh, yeah. And Montembeau no is the guy. Caden Primo has played way better. His confidence has been on the rise. He's signed for next year. Go with the 27 and 24 year old for the future and move out Allen and let these two guys actually play instead of trying to, to carry three like they have all season long. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Carrying three goalies. I don't care who you are. It's not, uh, it's not working ever. Um, Frank, uh, in your backyard, the uh, Philadelphia Flyers announced Sean Couturier as the uh, 20th captain in uh, franchise history. Start of the year, they said they weren't going to announce a captain. I actually kind of forgot they didn't have a captain. I just kind of assumed it was Kachuri. Like, it's not a shock that, that that he's the guy that they name as the a captain. It just, I don't know, for whatever, the timing just seems off for me. I don't, you know, just, I don't know. Maybe it's like they're like, hey, guess what? We're actually competitive, so we better have a captain here down the stretch. I don't know why that would matter, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the reason it came up was because Scott Lawton was the only player on the team wearing a letter. And the thought process was what, or John Tortorella was asked, what happens if you trade the only player that has a letter? I, again, I don't know that it really, like, nothing should change. Sean Couturier theoretically has been that team's leader for a long time, um, notwithstanding the time that he missed with the back injury. But he's he's been in the league for 13 years now. I mean, it's kind of incredible to think of, um, you know, where he started, where he is now. He he's the funny thing about Sean Couturier is I'm pretty sure he's exactly the same now as he was at 18. He was, <laughs> he was as stoic as they get. Um, when I spent a lot of time around him. So I think it's well-earned. I just, I agree with you. The timing is certainly odd. 
Now, I, the more I look at the Flyers, and I know they made this statement a few weeks ago, but and, and I wonder if maybe even then they're like, God, we're playing better than we think. And you always hear about the psychology of players when you at the after the trade deadline, you look around the room and you think your team's competitive, and all of a sudden you brought in, you know, player A or player B, and the guy's like, All right, management believes in us. Here we go. Well, you're the Flyers, and right now you've moved. You know, you're looking, you're you're actually only one point behind Carolina. Now, I know Carolina has games at hand, but they just keep winning, Frank. Like, you can look and say, yeah, we have a plan. But maybe the player's like, hey, management, like, are you kidding? You're going to trade Lawton or whoever else, and we're just going to gut guys as we're playing this well? Like, they haven't even, like, and we forget Carter Hart's gone. They they haven't even skipped a beat without Carter Hart. Like, I just... I wonder if the Flyers might have to reassess here. And, uh, you know, Lawton's got another year on his deal. I know Walker and, and Sealer are UFAs, and you've talked about how they'd like to re-sign Nick Sealer. So, um, like, I'm not I'm not sure that the Flyers are going to be the big seller if they even should be the big seller. Because you get in in the East, Frank, Could would any of us be stunned if they knocked off Carolina or the Rangers in the first round? Um, Hey, just some breaking news here. The Columbus Blue Jackets have fired GM Yarmo Kekalainen right now. There you go. Well, that's uh that's not a not a shock, Frank. Like, and honestly, I think the timing makes perfect sense. Right? Like you, you, you want to have if he's not gonna be your guy moving forward, he can't be the guy running your team before the trade deadline. It makes no sense. None right? of this season has made any sense. Yarmo yeah. Kekalainen should have been fired unceremoniously in September when Mike Babcock was fired. And instead, you know what the Blue Jackets did? Internally, I can tell you, the reaction was we got bleeped by the league and we got bleeped by social media and we got bleeped by spitting chiclets. They put their backs up and they were like, whoa, hold on a second here. Instead of being like, yeah, maybe we hired a guy that should have never been coaching again and we made a grievous error. Mm-hmm. Instead, they were like, whoa, they told us what to do and, and they screwed our season. That's that's a total line of bullshit. Yarmo Kekalainen knew exactly what he was doing and who he was hiring. Just go back and look through his his style of coach that he likes. And I'm not comparing the two, you know, in their actions, but in terms of how they coach and the hard edge that they have, John Tortorella and Mike Babcock are not all that different. So that's exactly what he wanted and he got it, but he should have been fired then. And then the rest of what's played out this year, this insanity of treating their young players the way that they have, Kent Johnson, David Yurichek, go down the list. The way they yeah. fumble effed the situation with Cole Sillinger as an 18 year old. Like, you can be a great drafting team. You can. But if you can't develop, it doesn't mean jack shit. Yeah, very true. Sorry. No, just, no. This was a long time coming. And I just, I can't believe that. You know, first off, I think a lot of questions, frankly, need to be asked of John Davidson. Where's John Davidson been throughout the entire process here? At what point with this team, as horrible as they've been, should the attention have been turned towards the young guys and next season? Instead, the manager was managing for his job. The coach is coaching for his job. And the president is what? In Florida? Where, where's he been? Well, uh, speaking of Davidson, he's going to assume the general manager's duty while the gl- club goes through the process of hiring a replacement. So clearly the uh, the ownership still uh, feels very highly of him because he's going to oversee uh, the, the next few weeks. And, you know, I, I don't know if Columbus is, is going to be a major player, Frank, at, at the at the trade deadline or not. It's They, they, they don't have be. a lot. They uh, should be well, selling off pieces left and right. Oh, but – I'm not sure like the pieces, do, which pieces do you want to sell? Like, I guess Jack Rastlovich for sure. Right. But you know, other than I don't him, think anyone's they... interested in him to be honest, well, but, ex- but I exactly. think you should be, your team is nowhere close. I don't think to competing. Yeah. Merz Lickens, I guess is another guy he's asked for a trade. So, you know, do you, do you allow Davidson to facilitate that? Or do you wait for your new guy to come in? That's probably a summer trade. I don't, I guess anything can happen, but 
You know, he's it's got 5.4 million for another three years. And his numbers have actually gotten better. Kevin Woodley uh, outlined it on my show here recently that uh, Merzlikens numbers have, have improved after a rough start, um, especially like, you know, expected saves and all that stuff. But uh, it's kind of fascinating. Like I don't, they don't really have a lot of pieces, Frank, that, you know, well, obviously they have a lot of young pieces that other teams would want, but if you're Columbus, as you alluded to earlier, like the hell are you trading away your young guys for now's the time to, to be playing your young guys even more. Right. Um, you know, can, could they move Andrew Peak? God, if a team wants to hundred percent, like yeah, there's some guys you could move on that back end. Um, but I'll Oh my God. There's those guys are heading for buyouts. Yeah. Do, yeah. A- Andrew poor Andrew peak. The last two seasons is minus 45. <laughs> Most of this year, he's been a healthy scratch. He yeah. he still has two more years remaining on his deal. This is only the first year of his deal. Yeah, it's, it hasn't worked out, has it? He he's a, he's a buyout. He's under twenty six. Yeah, makes sense at one third for sure. Well, actually, actually, his his birthday is before then, so there it's two thirds. Is they it two thirds? Yeah, because he's uh, oh yeah, he turns twenty. He turns twenty six on March seventeenth. Oh, well, that's a <laughs> kick in the nuts. Uh, just like it's. It's been one bad decision after another. It just, it really has been. And the fact that he got 11 calendar years as general manager is just, it's mind blowing. The lack of success, this whole idea of woe is us because we're Columbus. I've said it before. No one has any issue with Columbus. They oh really God, don't. it's a great place. It, no, it's, it's not, it's not the Blue Jackets. It's not the city, I should say that has kept that team from advancing and being a good team. And Hey, they, and like, look, Johnny Gaudreau signed there. So they, they've had other free agents. Um, I think, you know, and the thing was they actually built it up. They got competitive there that they, they, you know, they won a playoff series. Finally, they, they, you know, obviously upsetting Tampa Bay that one year was pretty big for them. And they just, after that, they haven't been able to, to make up any ground. And that's, that's really kind of been the, uh, the trouble with them, but you're right about, drafting potential they got lots of potential young guys there and uh, i'll be curious to see like that should be a like that should be a job frank if you're a gm that's a pretty attractive job when you consider all the young players they have like look at some of the other jobs that are going to come available here it's way player. it's good it, it, yes. i'm telling you it's really they're, good they're, i i just gave them props for their drafting it's you're starting with a decent foundation with the young players that you have you really are. Fantilli, Johnson, I'd include Sillinger in there. Juracek, Matejchuk. Um, I'd include Daniil Tarasov in there. Like, there, like, there's a whole bunch of reasons to be excited. It's just they got a lot of work to do. Oh, God, yeah. So off the top of your head, I know it just broke, Frank. Um, like, I'll be curious to see, like, who who they look at for this GM job, right? Because that's going to be the key here, right? Like they can't screw this up. They no. I, they can't, and um, they have to get it right. And I, I think they're they're going to need somebody like experience. You know what I was some- thinking about? Um, yeah. Not only is this an attractive job because of the prospects that they've assembled. But it's an attractive job because look at the tenure that Kekalainen was just afforded. You're not dealing with a psychopath owner who's pounding his fist on the table. He yeah. apparently, by all accounts, John McConnell is loyal, as you could see, probably to a fault. Um, and he gives you runway to work. So that's almost all you can ask for as a manager coming into a role is let me do my thing, one, and give me time to execute, two. Yeah. So I'd expect a number of people to be interested. Um, no one really jumps out at me off the top of my head. Give me some, give me a few minutes to think. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree. It's, you got to look and you go around and, and they're, they're smart. You know what? Wait till the end of the season. Cause there's going to be some assistant GMs and other guys that, that I think would be uh, ready right now. You know, you hire somebody in March or April, Frank, you're, you're, uh, you're shopping in a, in a very small uh, limited aisle. Is the way That's I why remember. John Davidson is taking over as yeah. the interim GM. Yeah. And they don't have a lot of major decisions to make, I think, between now and the end of the season. We talked about it. Like, they don't have a lot of guys 
you know, Merzlikens and Roslovich. And as you mentioned, like Roslovich makes four mil, even, even at half price, I don't think teams would be jumping to, to take him at the, uh, at the deadline. Um, what other managers do you think could potentially be in trouble this year that might shape that pool? Ooh, that's a good question. Rob Blake stands out to me. He said it himself that the bullseye yeah. is on his back. Yeah. And he made I the think, coaching change. I think the Kings would be, I'd be surprised. Like, and I guess the, to me, the, even if the Kings make the playoffs and losing the first round, Frank, I don't think that would cost him his job yet. Um, if they miss the playoffs and completely flame out, maybe a different, uh, you know, a different question. But like, I don't know. think there's one other guy on the, on the list of current GMs that is even remotely on a hot seat. No, none that I, I'm trying to like, you know, there's lots of new ones. Um, can't really see uh, any that uh, they're either new or cause especially their teams aren't there. So no, I agree with you. I don't 11 of the 32 teams, their manager has only been employed for two years or less. Yeah. So you look at the off season, you'd have Columbus job and you might have the Edmonton job if Ken Holland elects to retire, right? There's lots of people that think he's just going to, he's, you know, he's ready. He's had a great career, but you know, nothing. Yeah, uh, I don't, nothing's... I'd be shocked, like jaw on the floor, shocked if Ken Holland is back as GM. Yeah. Yeah, so there those would be the two jobs, Frank, and let's let's be real. One's a little, you'd have to one's think a little though, bit that, more attractive. Well, yeah, but you'd have to think that Jeff Jackson has spent this last however many months since he's been on the job as CEO of President of Hockey Ops that he he'd have at least some sort of people in mind already. That's my guess. Oh yeah, he's, I, I, he's probably been that. working on some internal list. Is my thought. Yeah, I would think so. He has, has time. And like, I'd be curious, like if I was Jeff Jackson and, and, and if Ken Holland and him are having the open conversation, he knows that, Hey, you know, Ken's ready to move on. Maybe he sticks on as an advisor for a bit. I don't know, but um, I would definitely be asking, you know, for his input. He's been a pretty successful GM for a long time. Oh, he should be involved in the process. I'm just don't know who it's going to be. Who, who yeah. has Jeff Jackson been thinking already? And, and frankly, who does Ken Holland have, in mind as well. Yeah, there's, we'll get into a few names now. Um, Phil Kessel, Phil, the thrill was, uh, on the ice in Abbotsford. He's skating. Um, you know, Rick talking and him have a, have a relationship of course, uh, from their time in Pittsburgh. And, you know, I, I see some people in Vancouver like, well, why would you do this? Well, my, why wouldn't you do it? What's, what's the major risk here? Phil Kessel's always been a very well-liked guy in the dress room, right? Uh, he can be self-deprecating. He doesn't take himself too serious. Um, he obviously, you know what, what does he need? I think eight points to get to a thousand in his career. So I think he's motivated by that. He's probably motivated Frank, by the fact that he didn't get to play in the playoffs last year for Stanley cup winning team. And so I, I look at Vancouver, man, they're third line right now, Dakota Joshua. We probably don't talk about that guy enough. What a season he's having, but do you, do you see Phil Kessel making this team? Like, you know, or do you think this is just a, let's see what he, kind of conditioning he's in, but you know, this is a, a low risk maneuver at this point. Like there's well, not, there's nothing to lose now. It's a no risk maneuver. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I don't think they've made any promises. I think they said, Hey, come in and skate and we'll see what you look like. You know, they, I, there's a ton of respect there. I think mutually, not just from the Canucks to Kessel, given their staff, Rick Tockett, I called him the Kessel whisperer and GM, well, now president Jim Rutherford, but from Pittsburgh, like they, they know him better than just about anyone. So they're going to be able to look at him pretty closely and say, do you have the goods or not? And I, I don't think they're in a position to hand out a charity signing. I really don't. But if they think that he's someone that can get back into shape and, and give them something, I think it's worth a try because just look at their lineup. Like, it's not that they have holes, but it's clear that they're still moving the puzzle pieces around to try and find the best fits. And so long as Pew Suter is playing second line left wing and Nils Hoaglander is playing first line left wing, you've got an opening to at least have someone come in and maybe add something a little different and try and find a different fit chemistry wise. So that I think is the thought process. And for whatever it costs, 800 grand prorated for the rest of the year. Like we're, it's not, not much money. And more than that, um, he's not going to be a pain in the ass. I don't think 
If no. it doesn't work out, I'm sure he's just going to be grateful for the opportunity and and move on. But I I have significant questions as to whether he can be an impactful piece. But I I don't think any team should be blamed from for trying. And one, just look at how aggressive they've been. They're constantly turning over mattresses all season long, whether it's depth moves, big boy trades like Elias Lindholm, whatever it is, they are going for it. And I, I applaud that. So if it means trying to sign Phil Kessel, you know, knock your socks off. But the fact that the Vegas Golden Knights last year, and you'd have to go back and ask Bruce Cassidy, but when you take a player and say that your lineup is better without him in it for 18 of your 22 playoff games in route to a Stanley cup victory, then to me that that's a strong message to send to any team that would be looking to get him. And that's probably a big reason why he went unsigned until Valentine's day or went without a team. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's all fair. So I, I, I don't mind the move at all for uh, for Vancouver. I think it, uh, you know, you get a little bit more depth and you see what you got and uh, and away you go. You get a player who could be hungry. Now, maybe he's got nothing left either, right? Like that's that's what you're going to find out here. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised either, Frank, if if he uh, if he comes back and, uh, you know, plays a few games in the American League first just to, to kind of see what he has, right? So maybe he, he goes a play RB route and signs a PTO first just to see. Like may, now maybe he doesn't want to, but at this point, if Phil is, is committed to wanting to get back to the NHL. That might be his only path to get there. This, this is probably it. Yeah. No, I mean, even doing the PTO, like in the AHL, just to see. If, yeah. Know. That's what I'm saying. He, he yeah. probably like, if I were the Canucks, I, you know, you can skate and practice all you want. I want to see him in a game and not that the AHL is the end all be all in terms of being the determinant, but you get a lot better sense and you'd want him playing games there anyway, before trying to bring him up to put him in an NHL lineup. You don't just come back and step right into the NHL. Even Corey Perry, who played earlier this season, needed, you know, a week to get his act together. Yeah. 10 days. No, no, it's uh, very true. Let's uh, bring in uh, Tyler Uremchuk now for a spirited Thursday edition. Spirited, huh? Uh-huh. Do you think Tyler's showering right now? What do you think he's doing? He might be. Remember back in the day when we first started three years ago with this, and he's he'd have like some like long speaker or some speaker turned up in his house that he'd yeah. be like cooking himself breakfast or I think that's what whatever, he's doing right now. Usually, whatever yeah. he'd be doing. Yeah. And then he'd 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 quick run back whenever it'd be like, Hey, it's time for Tyler's segment on the show. All right. Okay. I'm I am here. Um I don't run away anymore because I work in my basement now. I used to live in a small condo. Or if I turned up my speakers, I could hear you anywhere. So if I needed to, like, you know, make myself a bowl of cereal, I could comfortably do it. Now it's oh, oh yeah, it, that's I'm sure that's what you're doing the whole time—a bowl of cereal. Uh, yeah. Now you're, I mean, you're going bowling is what you're doing. <laughs> and now I would like to refill my coffee. I got to be quick because I never know when you're going to throw to me for uh, for this segment. But anyways, it is by ourselves, delivered by DoorDash. I had a speaker issue. I was sitting here. I didn't know anyone could hear me. I can hear you guys. It was a mess. Uh, Regardless, it's brought to you by our friends at DoorDash. For a limited time, our Canadian listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more. All you need to do, download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code NATION25. Uh, let's start with this from earlier in the week. A couple of NHLers hit the 1,000 game mark. Brad Marchand, Alex Petrangelo, both very accomplished careers so far. Are they both first ballot Hall of Famers? Buy or sell on that, Jason? That first ballot's hard. Um, Alex Petrangelo, and who was the other one? Brad Marchand. Brad Marchand. Oh. Yeah, it's a good uh, It's a good question. First ballot, I don't know. But I, I, do, I do think eventually they're probably both Hall of Famers. I don't know if they get in right away the first time. It all depends how many other guys are there at the time, right? But I think they're, I'll say this, I think they're surefire Hall of Famers. All right, Frank? I think both of them are surefire first ballot hall of famers petrangelo has he's one of the tyler rattled through these stats the other day oh no he's good he's one of the six or seven best defensemen of his generation plus add in the olympic success and gold medal 
two Stanley Cups backstopping two different teams, two different franchises to a cup. You know, elite, elite defenseman. So he's a lock. I think Marshand, you know, the points he's going to finish with, he said the other day his his quest was a thousand games, a thousand points, and a thousand pims. Oh, I think, get that. I think he's got the thousand pims locked down already. Yeah, he's, and a thousand games. Yeah, he's got so nine hundred and twelve or nine hundred fourteen points, something like that. Yeah, he's yeah. a unique player who was, again, for his generation, one of the few play driving wingers. And has Stanley Cup success and has World Cup of Hockey success. Like, what's the dent on Brad Marchand's resume? You're saying it's not not necessarily on, on him, but it's more on who else is available at the same time? Yeah, I think so. Like, he's never scored 40 goals. Like, you know, first ballot Hall of... Like, if, to me, first ballot Hall of Famers are like, there's no question we're not even thinking about it. It's a lock, right? So that's kind of the way I look at it. And, you know, when, when I look at other guys in the league at his time... I think there'd be other guys ahead of him. Fair. But I, I think mean, here, here's another ball. great stat to throw at you. So he does have the 100 point season. He has yep. four other, so not including that one, four other 80 plus point seasons. And for a four year period of time or five year period of time, four of them, he was either the number one choice or the number two choice for all end of season all-star left wing. So for four out of five years, he was the first or second best player at his position. End of season all-stars mean a lot because it it tells you re- relative to the rest of your peers. That's a pretty elite group that have that type of end of season all-star success that make them really strong candidates for the hall. Uh, the stat I threw the other day. So defensemen who have both played a thousand games in the cap era and average more than 24 minutes time on ice in those games. It's Chara, Weber, Latang, Bomeister, Suter, Petrangelo, Keith, and Doughty. And what's actually crazy, who knows if he holds at this number? None of those guys are above 25 minutes, except for Doughty, who's actually 2614. That's his average time on ice during his career, which is bananas to think he's like. He's a minute and a half clear of second on that list in Duncan Keith. It's crazy. Uh, all right, next one I got for you guys. Connor McDavid picked up a six-point night earlier in the week. He is now just 13 points back of Nikita Kucherov. Buy or sell on McDavid winning the scoring title this season. He's got five games in hand on Kucherov as well. Sorry, yeah, five games in hand on Kucherov. So, Frank, buy or sell? I'll buy. I mean, the casual six-assist night will help. You just drop in another one or two, four or five point nights, and you're going to be in really good shape. I think the most amazing part of the Oilers season is that for a chunk, a large chunk of their 16 game winning streak, Connor McDavid was not their leading scorer. Tells me he's got a lot left in the tank. Yeah. So he was 22 points back of the scoring race on January 24th. Which, if you look at the history of the Art Ross, that would be the latest. Anyway, and there's only ever been three players who have come back from a 20-point deficit. Uh, uh, Henrik Sedin was one, but that's when Sidney Crosby got the concussion, right, uh, against Washington, David Steckel. So he was 20 points back of him, but then Crosby didn't finish the season, didn't play the second half. So there's a little asterisk there. Uh, Merrill Lemieux once caught Gretzky when he was 23 points behind him, but Gretzky missed 16 games, and uh, Lemieux ended up ahead of him. Gretzky had a higher points per game. But uh, Lemieux had more points. And uh, Peter Forsberg in 2003, 32 points behind uh, Mary Lemieux. Uh, that was the year Lemieux obviously missed some games, uh, was coming back. He was banged up, you know, coming back from uh, lymphoma. But still, uh, Forsberg did end up with a slightly higher points per game. So I look at McDavid. He could be the first guy ever to do it when there's no injuries involved, potentially. It'd be massive. Um, here's the stat for you guys, though, that why I think he can't. McDavid's actually been very... For his standards and really all the NHL players, I went through the top 10 guys the last eight years in the league, and they all score more points on the road uh, at home than on the road, but not by a massive amount, but like they'll average 1.25 to maybe 1.08. McDavid in his previous eight years was 1.55 points per game at home, 1.44 on the road. Not a major difference. This year, 
McDavid has 51 points at home and 26 on the road. And they haven't had a bigger schedule difference as far as tougher teams or not. Uh, I think McDavid's ready to get going because the Oilers power play guys, for whatever reason, under Knobloch, 40% at home, 15% on the road. So the reason why, if, they're, if their road power play wakes up, I think for sure it's a lock he does it. There you go. You can also check out those odds over at Botano.ca. What are the odds right now? Ah, uh, what are the odds right now? I was just going over to pull that up. Well, if you want to talk Hart Trophy, Nathan McKinnon is minus 143, Kutrov plus 250, and McDavid plus 350. And it looks like right now they don't have the scoring race up. They do have the Rocket Richard, which Matthews is running away with, oh, but nothing yeah, for Art Roth right now. What's what's Reinhardt at, just for fun? Oh, to catch Matthews? Uh, yeah. Reinhardt is four and a half to one, plus 450. That's not well, bad. You know, that's not bad at all when you consider, like, you know, what if a guy gets hurt for two weeks? Yeah, he is only three goals back. Like, that's yes. not terrible. No. Interesting. All right. Uh, last one I got for you guys. Always need to throw in a little trade deadline related question to wrap it up. Frank, earlier this week on Daily Face Off Live, you talked about the possibility of Jacob Markstrom moving on from Calgary, maybe how close that was a couple days ago. You also, in one of your mock trades up at dailyfaceoff.com or your deadline matchmaker deals, you floated the idea of maybe Andrew Mangiapani being in the mix. I'm going to say the Flames sacrifice at least three more players off their roster. So Hannafin, Tanev, and at least one more before the deadline. Frank, are you buying or selling on that? I will buy. I don't know what they're going to package together, if anything. They have the ability to get creative. Um, I mentioned in a mock, you know, fun Valentine's Day trade proposal on Wednesday, the idea of moving a Manjapani who probably isn't in the long-term future and they could retain on him to, to get a better return. Um, but what about Markstrom? That would be your third guy. So the fact that they were already pretty close. So, you know, I think that lends itself to, you know, pretty strongly being a third guy. I'll buy. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to buy. I, I think th there, there's so many teams that are looking for defensemen. Heck, I wouldn't be surprised if a team comes after Jordan Osterley just to get him a deaf defenseman on another team, you know, like that could be an easy guy to look at. It doesn't cost you very much, you know, being around the league a long time. He's kind of your good seven or eight defenseman that the team's like, Hey, we'll give you a six rounder or something for him uh, as a pending UFA. So yeah, I think I could easily see the flames moving a third body. There you go. That is a wrap on this week's edition of buy or sell delivered by DoorDash. Dash that for the win this week and let DoorDash handle the cooking. The uh, the race, you know what? To give Sam Reinhardt credit, man. A lot of people thought Matthews would be running away with the uh, the Rocket Richard, but uh, Reinhardt just continues to roll uh, for them. The Florida Panthers, Frank, uh, continue to roll. They're now within two points of uh, Boston for uh, first in the East and uh, first in the Atlantic Division. But uh, man, like Reinhardt, hey, he's he's cooking. It's everything's working well for him. Do I do I think this is? I know he's going to get a big contract here, um, and it's great timing for him. But I also, I do wonder, you know, you've heard the comments from him that, hey, this is a great year for him, but is this a repeatable year? That's probably going to be the main question. I, gonna I don't even like think that matters. No. Well, they should. I think because... what has been his repeatable bar that he set, almost every single year, you can set and forget 30 goals, 30 assists. Yeah, that's fair. So that alone, that bar is is worth a significant, significant contract. Then add on the chemistry that he's had playing with Barkov and what that means to the Panthers. I don't, I don't see a, like people have been saying, Oh, there's no way they can afford him. I don't see a way in which they let him go. I really don't. Is, he, is his deal starting with a nine? I think you just do it right now. Eight years times 9 million. Eight years. Ah. See, to me, it's the term. I'm always, I'm leery of term. You have the, to do the term in order to play the game. Yeah. Like I, I'm all, I, I wonder, like, organizations should look around and be like, hey, wait a sec. If one of the best goal scorers in leagues only wanting to sign shorter term, why are we signing middle tier guys to massive long term deals? Like, I and I, I get the whole why the players want it. I totally understand it. But the teams at some point, if you want to lock in your best players, okay. But, 
history is proven in the NHL that, man, there's lots of guys, 32, 33, it starts to slide down. So, but um, I wonder if that's ever going to change in the NHL, if you need a few teams to do it, or maybe it'll change when more elite guys, Frank, start going the I don't think the more Austin elite Matthews guys part. are going to do it because they've proven that they can get the term and the dollars. What but if the cap going to see a change is when, whenever the league decides to change the cap formula, which in my, in my opinion, and this is a larger debate is antiquated, just taking the total dollars and dividing it by the number of years. Like you can fudge the contract any which way you want. You can load it up in the front and there's limitations. You can load it up in the back. You can make it buyout proof. Like there's all these machinations that exist that, Sometimes what you see in AAV is not necessarily what it is. And by the way, for the cap purposes, the league has a really significant cash over cap problem in that they're paying out way more cash this year than what the cap is. And it, it hurts how the, the future part of the system works in terms of balancing it all out. When you pay out more this year than what your AAVs are, it changes everything in terms of the escrow component. So there's a lot that really goes into understanding the system. And I don't think you're going to see a change so long as teams can just add an extra year and bring the AAV down, which is all they really care about. Yeah, I wonder if we see the superstars realize it. So now you've gone through COVID, where it's basically a flat cap, Frank, for five years. Right. Essentially, if we look at what it's being like minimal growth. And so then you sign the long term, it really hasn't changed. But if all of a sudden the cap's going to grow incrementally here over the next five years, you sign an eight year deal or whatever it is. By the time you get to year year four, if you're still playing very well, now you're like, son of a bitch. Like, look at Sidney Crosby. Right. Sidney Crosby, like the long term deal. Now, obviously, he never, his 12 he never thought he was going to be playing at this point in his career. Yeah. Fair point. Why? Why do you think his contract is structured in a way that right now, do you know yeah, this crazy. season, last season, and next season, he's earning yeah. for these three years a total of nine million bucks? Yeah. Oh, I know. With yeah. no signing bonus? Yep. Yeah, he I was got collecting a lot of his 12 per yeah. season for a while to start the deal. And it was loaded that way because he was just coming off all the concussions when he signed it on July 1st. 2012 and the idea was hey let's just get through these few high earning years because i doubt i'm gonna even be in the picture earning three million a year yeah so but i still i look at matthews and i, I think matthews is the one guy who understands the system right now for for elite players I'm not talking middle tier guys i, I think matthews understands it because you look at he is maximized right away all the time and never was there a time where he wasn't one of the top earning guys. And, and I think if you're an elite player, that's what you would look at to me. Like I would, if I was an elite player, Frank, I'd be following the Matthews uh, playing card now uh, moving forward for the next, especially once you're 28, because you get to 32. Now the elite players it's proven in sports. The elite players can stay elite longer. Mm -hmm. So why, why shortchange yourself? Like, you know, the NBA is a prime. Well, here's the difference. You, you So you asked relative to Reinhardt, right? So we just talked about eight times nine. That's 72. Mm -hmm. Matthew's got 53 over four. Yeah. Well, well, but it's it all for the player. It, it comes down to total dollars. This is the only big deal Sam Reinhardt's ever going to get. No, no, Frank. Sam Reinhardt, of course, I understand why he wants eight because I don't put him in the Matthews. He's not, he's not elite. He's not going to get that. You, you know, in four years, like this is his, this is his, well, I think money he is a lead. I think he's just not a, he's not a, in the super yeah. duper star category. Well, that's what elite is to me. We, we, we've, we've dummied down the word elite. It's like, everybody's great. No, there's well, elite that, players. 30, there's 30 like is elite. Like it just is like, no, it isn't. How many guys in the league every year score 30, 30? Well, he's done it three times. This is his third year in his career. Third in a row. Elite. Yeah, but still, that to me, that's not. A and leader. he was not. He was. He was right on the door of that. Um, in. Uh, in, oh, in Buffalo. Well, twenty close. He had was uh, twenty two and forty three, right? So. Yeah, nah, on, me, on on a thirtieth place Sabers team. I know, but that's not elite. That's all I'm saying. I think there's way okay. too much 
We try. It's like the participation ribbon. Oh, well, everybody's good. And it's not a knock. It doesn't mean Sam Reinhardt's not a really, really, really good player. Okay. I might even, you might even say he's a great consistent player, but he's not elite in my eyes. The elite guys are the McDavid's, the McKinnon's, I Pasternak, McCars, Quinn Hughes, those guys to me, like top end elite drivers of your team. I think in Florida, you'd, I, Kachuk would be more elite. Barkov would be more elite for me. I just, I think we, I, I think mean, we can we quibble can. on the semantics. I, I'd put them in a category totally unto themselves. And I did, I actually did a lot of this work trying to assign players archetypes. I came up with, this was not this season, last season. I came up with a franchise player category. There's only 17 of them. Yeah. The that's league. what elite is. <laughs> that's why I call them elite. Right? Okay. I, I just, I disagree. Cause like, you know, when you get to contracts like Sam Reinhardt is going to get, that puts him into the elite category of player in the league. It does. Nah, uh, we'll we'll disagree. Do you want to hear my seventeen franchise players? Well, and probably... we might some of them are are not anymore. Nah. This is from t October twenty twenty two. McDavid, Matthews, McCarr, McKinnon, Drysital, Kaprizov which I probably wouldn't have in that category now. Shesterkin, Hedman, Barkov, Vasilevsky, Yossi, Kucherov, and this is where it gets a little squirrely, Patrick Kane, Sidney Crosby, Matthew Kachuk, Ilya Sorokin, and Alex Ovechkin. Yeah, well, some of the guys were older in their career, right? Like Ovi, Crosby, and them. So it, were they elite franchise guys for the majority of their career? 100%. Now, not so much, but that's more of an age, I think, than, than anything else. It's hard to to remain elite, elite forever. Although Crosby's still pretty damn good. Still, yeah. His numbers, but um, I'd probably add in Hellebuck now. I'd probably add in Haskinen. What about uh, Elias Peterson? Uh, oh, Peterson would be in there for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't I don't have much uh, now there there might be a few uh, like D men at times maybe maybe get over Quinn Hughes right. is knocking on that door too. Oh Quinn Hughes is really good, right? Um yeah, so I uh I just I think if all I'm saying to me, Sam Reinhardt, I get why he wants a long term. If I'm running an organization, if I could get what's gonna happen to make it easier for the teams is if the elite guys start going short term. It's a lot easier to say, hey, man, I'm not if I'm not giving my elite guy long term, why the hell am I giving you at the age of 28? I really think the NHL, you talked about the uh, cap to uh, salary that's being paid out right now. Cash right? over cap. Yeah, you, you look how much of that is wasted dead cap space, right? From buyouts and things like that. I the the if the NHL, honestly, and I've done all the numbers, if you limited it to five year deals at the age of 28, it actually hurt, it helps all your players. Your best guys get max dollars. Your mid-tier guys are still getting good dollars. And the thing is now, when those mid-guys fan out, the young guys coming up now, they'll get the money that they deserve rather than having a bunch of guys who are uh, you know, getting $9 million to score you 30 or 40 points because they used to score you 60, right? It hurts your cap. It would actually be better overall. I'm just not sure they'd ever have the, uh, the, the long-term wherewithal to look at it, but it, it would take people to actually step back, remove their ego and emotion and realize this would actually be better for all players and the league to do it. Yeah. I think it's just when you're dealing with a union, it's going to be a hard sell to limit people because you still have the freedom to let's say you only will do like the team. Like you always have it in your power to go shorter. Austin Matthews is the one who has forced short-term deals from the Leafs. The Leafs wanted to go eight years both times. Yeah. So it's you have it available to you. Why would you then limit the other guys that want to go eight years for security reasons? Well, you can go eight at a young age, right? That's what I said after the age of 20. Because right now it's you can you what is it, maximum seven for free agents, right? Mm -hmm. And eight for hometown. So if you went five and six, I'm not sure it's gonna. Like those extra two years, man, is a big difference. Cause you look at the, at the death trap contracts that like you're like, God, if we would only sign this guy for four years instead of six or seven, right. It's crushing. So there's lots of numbers to prove that it would be smart. And uh, for the players, I think it would, uh, long-term security. I understand all the, but if we're talking long-term security, Frank, like 
Guys are already making you. You could sign an eight-year deal for five years. You got 40 mil. You got a lot of long-term security. Let's not kid ourselves. Yeah. So it would be, uh, it'll be an interesting one uh, to consider. The uh, Well, Frank, we got three days left to see if, uh, if there's a trade before uh, Sunday or not. Uh, I know both of us were hoping on Monday that there would be. Um, I quickly want to end discussing the, the what I call the mushy middle in the NHL right now. You look like in the West, there's the top six teams. I think everybody knows who the top six teams are, the top three. Then you've got guys like LA, who I can't believe they got spanked by Buffalo that bad. Saint I was Louis, just going to say quickly before you move on, we did this fun little thing in Daily Face Off Live yesterday with Tyler, and you had to hand out a Valentine and break up with someone. I broke up with the Kings. I'm sorry. You're no longer in my elite six teams yeah. in the West. It was that's seven. Fair. It's now down to six. Yeah, that's totally valid. Um, Kings, Blues, Preds, Flames, the Wilder, you know, like those teams, they've shown they can be good, Frank, and then they've shown they can be really bad. And what, what's unique about them that they get in, maybe they find out that they have a series where they're the good team again, because they've all had stretches of it. And it's no different than Detroit, New Jersey, the Islanders, the Penguins, like there's races for both the wall cards in both sides, which is entertaining. I'm just like these teams, I can't predict it. Like from week to week, honest to God, you have no idea. So that makes it good. But I don't. I wouldn't feel comfortable right now picking the two wild card teams in either spot. Because from like Minnesota could easily get in all of a sudden, right? Like it wouldn't shock me. How many times are we going to say in one year's worth of podcast that the eighth seed is quite literally anyone's? It is an absolute pillow fight. Well, even the seventh, right? Well, now the seventh, but. I yeah. still think the Kings probably do enough to hang on. They're too talented not to. You'd think so, right? Like, and the Wild, like, what if the Wild, like, they've won four in a row now? What if they keep rolling? Do, do you think that takes Mark Andre Fleury off the table? I think so. Um, I, I think it's all going to be his call. I, I wouldn't be shocked if he ends up staying put. Yeah, to be honest. But and not not necessarily for playoff reasons, just. You only uproot your family. You only make the decision to to go chase if you think that you can find the right fit. And for him, it's it's playing time, opportunity. He's not just going there to be a nice guy and smile at everyone. No one needs yeah. to no one needs to leave their family for three months to do that. No. Fair. No, it's just I don't know, man. It's from week to week. It's gonna be fascinating. And, and that's why we might have a real late trade deadline because some teams are just they're like, God, I'm not sure. Like, maybe we're good. Maybe we're not. Or, Philadelphia, maybe, Minnesota. May, no, well, no. All those teams, John Tortorella reiterated again yesterday, we're making hard decisions and we're, you know, we're trading Ooh. players because we have the long view in mind. Okay. And that's smart. So he, that's what Calgary's doing. Calgary's not being swayed by one good no. four-game Eastern Conference road trip. Out, you know, that that's not going to do it. But... I I think we more or less know the market now. Pittsburgh to put a bow on our entire pod. I think the way that they've played, like I, if I were Kyle Dubas, which I'm not, um, I I think you know enough now to know that this team isn't very good. Yeah. Wow. Well, and before he that... gets hurt again, or depending on how serious it is, you've got the the. But I'd say if he's truly available, the best, most impactful player at the deadline, regardless of position, I think you got to move him and you got to get the haul and you got to jumpstart your rebuild, regardless of whatever Sid and whoever else say. Yeah. How many times do we see teams miss significant players in the playoffs and still win it all? Reminder that the Penguins won a Stanley Cup without Chris Letang. True. Why can't the Pittsburgh Penguins trade Jake Gensel and still make the playoffs? That's valid Does point. one player no, disrupt their entire season? And if no. not, shouldn't that just be the the MO of every franchise that's in any similar spot? Yeah. Well, you know the only way, Frank, that Jake Gensel could uh, upend their season? Is By if being this hurt. Yes. 
Yeah. And uh, to recap, where we started, it doesn't help you on the ice and it doesn't no. help you on the trade market. That would be the worst case scenario for the pens and all the teams that were like, Hey, I think we could, we'd be interested in Jake Gensel, which for sure. is another so. reason why the Calgary flames sooner rather than later should move Chris Tanev. Oh God. Every game you watch, it looks like he's, he's, yeah, on but the he's been going down the tunnel hurt. twice a night since yes. October. Like I, like I, I don't know what more you need to see unless you just think he's, he's made of steel. I don't know. No, I'm with you 100%. Yeah, no, 100%. Frank, have yourself a wonderful weekend. All the listeners, thanks as always for uh, listening. Frankie, what, what day did you make it to? Are you still I, I, I won. I, I, I did win one day, and I tried to make it to day three, but the Bolts beat the Bruins, and I lost. Oh, you picked the Bruins to win. Well, that's I could understand that pick. So, Don't okay. ever take advice from me. No, no. Bad well, sports hey. better, bad... Wendy's daily face-off survivor game player. Yeah, well, Although it I, is really hard. <laughs> well, if it was easy, then everybody would do it. That's what I always say, right? That's why you take pride if you're able to uh, to win a week or get even through the week unscathed. So uh, go to dailyfaceoff.com, play the uh, Wendy's survivor pool. You can win weekly prizes, but more importantly, you could win $5,000 in cold, hard cash. And, uh, who couldn't use a nice 5G note in the, uh, in the pocket? Check it out, dailyfaceoff.com for the Wendy's Daily Survivor Pool. You can't miss it in the top right corner. We will chat with everyone on Monday.